Hello, and welcome to Sonata She Wrote. Today, I am discussing the sixth song in Schubert's cycle, Winterreise, Wasserflute, or Flood. In terms of its structure, this song is one of the simplest in the entire cycle, a very brief, strophic form, A, A prime, repeat. It's also one of the songs in which Schubert modifies the original text of the poem, in this case, to fit the repeated verse. In this section of the Cambridge Companion, written by Hallmark, you can see how Schubert modified the stressed and unstressed syllables in the original to fit his music. A few people have been kind enough to comment that they have used these videos to help them prepare the songs in this cycle for various purposes. And because of that, before we get into the actual song, I want to discuss a performance practice issue regarding rhythm, which this song is often at the crux of. As you can see in the piano introduction to this song, we have a dotted rhythm written against triplets. This tends to raise the question of whether to tripletize the dotted rhythm, essentially changing the dotted eighth sixteenth rhythm to this quarter eighth triplet rhythm. In the recording of the cycle I've been using, Tom Began and Jan von Elsacker, they choose to tripletize the rhythm so that the soprano voice and bass voice align. However, you don't have to look very far for an example of the inverse. This reference recording of Gerald Moore and Dietrich Fischer Dieskau is performed as written, a triplet against a dotted eighth sixteenth. Ian Bostridge, in his book about Schubert's cycle, writes of his experience in performing this rhythm as written, and the surprised reaction he perceived in the audience. I, Bostridge, was performing all three Schubert cycles twice through, with Julia Strake, at the Wigmore Hall. In one of the Winterizes, I noticed that an exceptionally distinguished pianist, and great Schubertian to boot, was sitting at the end of row H on the right. I had recognized him fairly quickly as I scanned the hall in the moments before the cycle kicking off, making that initial visual connection with the audience that has become almost a ritual. Only a little later did I see that he was following the music with his score, always a little off-putting if you're singing something by heart, and that he was sitting next to another, younger, but also distinguished, instrumentalist. As Julius launched into the first bars of Wasserflut, the pianist in the audience, let us call him A, started to look with incredulity at the music. Shaking his head, he turned to his companion, let us call him B, and jabbed a finger at the notes. I don't remember B's reaction, but the coup de grace came when A swung his body right around to communicate his artistic descent, revealing that the person in the row directly behind him was another famous pianist, C, who seemed rather taken aback at the disturbance. What was going on? Why was our harmless performance of this harmless song causing such a fluster? As you may be able to gather from these three pianists rather rude reaction, there is a relative musicological consensus on how these rhythms should be performed, and that is that the dotted rhythm should be assimilated within the triplet. Many musicologists apply this not only to Schubert, but backward and forward through much of the 18th and 19th centuries. In the foreword to the Vienna Urtext edition of Haydn's Piano Sonatas, Robert Levin writes, quote, In conjunction with the passages in faster tempi, Haydn observes the 18th and 19th century practice of using dotted rhythms, which were commonly aligned with triplets in performance. End quote. Martino Trimo, writing in the foreword to the Vienna Urtext edition of Schubert's Piano Sonatas, goes even farther and I've included a picture of the text so that we can all be clear on the rhythms in question. He writes that Schubert's use of rhythms like the dotted eighth sixteenth has been much misunderstood. It appears he never wrote the rhythm triplet quarter eighth, and it seems inconceivable that he, who employed triplet rhythms with such regularity, should deliberately avoid this rhythmical figure. The well-known example of the written rhythm in Ersterung, 
and if you take a look at Ersterung, I think it's fairly obvious that Trimo actually means Wasserflut here. From De Winterreise leaves no doubt that the sometimes dotted eighth sixteenth actually equals triplet quarter eighth. This is often the case when the dotted rhythm occurs in the context of triplets. It's actually not the case that Schubert never wrote the triplet quarter eighth rhythm. He wrote it roughly 30 to 40 times, but considering how large Schubert's output is, I don't think that meaningfully changes Trimo's point. On the other side of this debate, Bostridge, whose chapter on this song presents an excellent summary of both sides of this argument, and would be a great addition to anyone's library who needs to perform these songs, points out the preferences of J.S. Bach, the pedagogue Johann Quantz, and Beethoven himself on the side of performing the rhythm as written. Quantz, an 18th century flute teacher, makes an especially compelling argument. Quote, If one tried to assimilate the dotted figure to the value of the triplet figure, the expression created thereby would not be brilliant and splendid, but lame and monotonous instead, end quote. What I personally am trying to accomplish here is to reinsert some ambiguity into this issue. Yes, it is more or less standard to assimilate the triplets in this piece, and to be perfectly honest, I think it sounds fine when this is done. To do so is to make this a non-issue. You will likely not raise any eyebrows by performing it this way, and that obviously has a lot of value. However, in performance practice, I feel your guiding star should always be your own musical taste. If you do your research, or allow me to do some for you, you can see that a variation in performance can easily be well-reasoned. And if you need some ammunition against a teacher, or even against your own assumptions to perform this music as written or otherwise, you now have some. As unassuming as the assimilation of the triplets is, I personally like to raise an eyebrow myself. And as we'll see, Begin and Elsacker also know how to raise an eyebrow or two. Moving on to the song, Susan Ewens writes that Schubert set Wasserflut as a strophic binary song form. The music for stanzas 1 and 2, then repeated literally for stanzas 3 and 4. By dividing the song into halves in this manner, he makes apparent the contrast between misery in the minor mode and fantasy in the major mode. At the same time, he derives the latter from the former. Just as the tears of the first verse give rise to the imagined future springtime of the second verse. Within the first verse, the music represents the bitter reality of the wanderer's tears and the biting cold of his surroundings. In the second section, in the relative major, the wanderer imagines the coming of spring and the thaw that it implies. Springt in Schollen und ihr reiche Schnee zerrinnt. Und ihr weiche Schnee zerrinnt.
As the verse ends, the Wanderer abruptly returns to the tonic of the song, a shocking return to his own reality which therefore sounds as a bitter response to the fantasy of the major mode sections. Again, Ewens writes, quote, What is so compelling about this instance is the fact that the second statement is clearly a reaction to the first. Having made a statement, Schubert's Wanderer feels compelled to revise it, to alter its emotional temperature and degree of passion, end quote. You no doubt also noticed Begin's use of ornamentation in the outro of the verse, or in this case, the intro to the second verse. Ornamentation would have been, and still is, a very common practice, especially, as in this case, with music that repeats multiple times. It wouldn't necessarily be inappropriate to ornament every time this figure reappears, but I feel that Begin's choice to do so only after each verse both allows the piano to shine for a moment and doesn't distract from the vocal performance, which I think it's fair to say is generally the star of the show. Schubert's use of F-sharp minor and A major are only a part of what sets the two halves of this song, reality and fantasy, into relief. It could almost be any two keys, because his refusal to prepare the keys in any way is what makes it so effectively jarring. When moving into A major, there is no common chord modulation. We simply leave a cadence in F-sharp minor and immediately move to a half cadence in A major, and vice versa when the Wanderer bitterly repeats the line of his beloved's house. We're simply slammed back into the reality of the minor key. This video sticks out a little in the cycle for some more concrete performance practice information, but I hope you found it useful or at least interesting. If you'd like to support the channel, consider joining the crew of my patrons you see on the screen now at patreon.com slash sonatashiro. And as always, thanks for joining me.